I hope you're all seeing my screen now. Um, I'm calling this this talk for you all the Shark Tank dance. And in a moment, we'll see why. Um, but I would like to start by congratulating you all, just like Holly was earlier. Like this is a huge accomplishment that you have already um, achieved. And now you're going to this next phase of it. And it would be very understandable if some of you are feeling some nervousness or trepidation about that. I just came out of a presentation uh, myself and I was nervous about that too. So um, let's see here, I am clicking and I'm not getting to the next screen. So we'll find out what, uh, what happened. Okay, there we go. Uh, so there's that picture again. I do work at Cripe. I also should mention in the presentation I just gave right before this uh, was for my MARC, my Master of Architecture thesis. I'm currently on a almost 100% sabbatical from work uh, in order to finish my thesis. So that's been wonderful. And Ball State is, um, I'm just really, I'm, I'm digging it. I'm loving it. Uh, okay, with that, let's get into the Shark Tank. Um, I'm calling this a Shark Tank dance because here's what I think about when I think about a Shark Tank, um, is I think about really brutal things like I was very when I saw Jaws as a child in the 80s I didn't get in a pool for a while you know like sharks are scary um, I believe that the ways that we frame uh, the situations that we're going to go into have an enormous effect on the way that we behave in that situation and so there's going to be really this is sort of a pep talk you know uh and my pep talk to you is that the way you frame this thing that you're about to go through will be the main determinant of how you experience it you know your frame on life is how uh, you interpret the events that you're surrounded by so instead of thinking about this as a shark tank i understand where they're coming from that um, like it makes sense and there is this is a this is we live in a world of critique most of us and so we're used to getting up and having people critique us um, but I'm going to suggest that instead of the shark tank part we focus on the dance part and the reason why I think it's important to uh, to frame this is because I really I think it it, it is going to affect your experience so uh, before we get into that before we get into the the big idea let's let's talk about what we're going to talk about so first we're going to talk about metaphors because like i said i think the metaphors you use for your life control the way you experience everything then we're going to talk about some specific strategies that you can use as you plan the final details on your posters and your presentations and then we're going to get down into the weeds with some actual tactics like think like things that you can do you know um and so there, there's one idea uh, in the metaphor uh, component, one big idea. And then at the strategy level, I'm going to give you several suggestions for that. And then when we get down to the level of tactics, there's actually going to be a bunch of them. And with anything in this presentation, just like I would suggest you approach all presentations you hear, don't necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater. If I say something that, you know, doesn't sit right with you, that's cool. Just ignore it. But I think at least within this handful of things I'm going to share, there's going to be some helpful things. So, so tactics are at the level, the ground level, you know, strategies. If we're thinking about this again, metaphorically get higher. We're looking down from above at what we're doing. And then if we get to the level of metaphors, we're really like, that's like, you know, airplane view. Okay. So I already said it, I believe that your metaphor controls everything, your metaphor for the way you approach life. And if we look at that um, in a number of ways, we could say, you could say life is a game, right? And when you think about that, that creates a certain sense of emotions. You could think about this event that's coming up as a game. That's a little bit different than a shark tank, right? Um, another kind of game, though, is actually not nearly as happy as the last game and also not a team sport. So if you're thinking of games, I wouldn't be thinking about this as a game of chess. I'd be thinking about it as more of a, a team sport. Um, you could have a negative metaphor here. You could think about life or this presentation as a war. I would not suggest that as a healthy or positive metaphor because of everything that comes along with it. But you could also conceive of this as a play, a show that you're putting on for the for the jury and the audience. You could also, if you want to go a little bit further out, you could um, imagine this as a dream. Um, life could be imagined as a dream or this contest could be imagined as a dream. The point of all of this is just to say that your metaphor controls everything. I suggest something like this. It's a dance. It's a party because of the way that you will then approach it. So um, your metaphor controls everything, like I've said, but I think when it comes 
relates to this project, we can get even a little more specific. We can say that your concept or your narrative for your project, that actually should be the controlling force for everything that you're doing. The concept for your project is the most important thing that you have. It's, it's what you're selling us. And you're selling it to us through your images and through your words and through your physical models, if you have them in your posters. Everything that you're doing should be selling that narrative. So if we look at the metaphor, or in this case, the narrative of a dance, you know, a dance is fun and a dance is interactive. I really like that component of it. And a dance is also entertaining or a party is entertaining. And so I believe this is a much more positive metaphor. That's why I called the talk the shark tank dance because on the shark tank side of it, if we focus on that, it's deadly. Something with big teeth is biting at you. It's very one-sided unless you're another shark. But if you're a human in a shark tank, you know, <laughs> that there's only really one direction that's gonna go. And also, and this is the biggest, is that it's fear-based. And if you're coming at this presentation from a position of fear, you are not going to give it the, the same um, emotional performance as if you're coming at it from the perspective of fun. And I would definitely choose fun over fear. Um, so again, your metaphor controls everything. More specifically, your concept or your narrative for your project controls everything. And so pick a metaphor that works for you for this. You don't have to pick my metaphor. It doesn't have to be a dance. But I'm just suggesting, you know, flip the script. Pick something aside from Shark Tank with which you want to frame this experience that you're about to go through. Okay, these are not the droids you're looking for. Uh, the point of this slide is, one, to see if you're paying attention. I, I don't know if there were laughs or groans there. Um, as a dad, sometimes I'm actually going more for a groan than a laugh. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> whether you chuckled or whether whatever, I was trying to get your attention. And now I want to get a little bit meta. And for a moment, you are now looking at the, the behind the scenes PowerPoint of the PowerPoint I'm giving you, right? And we're going to walk through some things real quick. Title slide, actually very lackluster, not exemplary for what I just told you. But then we get we, right away, we go into heavy visuals and a big idea. And from there, we go into an introduction of here's what I'm going to tell you and here is the structure for what I'm about to do. That way people aren't lost. They know, okay, we're gonna start here and we're gonna go there and then we're gonna end somewhere else. And then I, in words, and I said it out loud and I showed you on the screen the words that I'd already said, which was the met, your metaphor controls everything. I said that again and again and again and again. And all the while I was showing you images, large images that I hope were captivating. I repeated my theme one more time. I gave you some more evidence for why I was suggesting what I was suggesting. I repeated the theme again. I think it's debatable whether or not I should have done that. But then, this is the point, I then told you what to do. I said, pick a metaphor that works for you. Now, by the time I got to that purple slide, I have a feeling that you really didn't feel like I was twisting your arm because of the way I got you there. I I, I gave you all these options and I showed you everything, but then I told you what to do. I didn't. I, I didn't phrase it as a question, I phrased it as a command, but I'm guessing it felt pretty soft. And that's kind of what this slide was intended to say, is that when you deliver your thesis, your concept, whatever the main idea is, by the time you lead us to that, uh, you really want it to feel like you're saying, these are not the droids you're looking for. Whatever you tell us, we should just believe it, okay? Uh, here's the slide we're on right now uh, to get even more meta, and then here is where we're going. Okay, so. Now, with that, let's get into the Shark Tank dance and talk about really dancing with the jury because that's what this is about. And Steve, uh, the presenter after me, who was actually in fact my juror um, when I competed, which I think is very amusing. And, and you know, Steve, if Steve disagrees with me about uh, what I'm suggesting, I, I hope he says so because that would be really a fun conversation. Um, I liked dancing with Steve um, during that talk. So we talked about metaphor. That's where we just came from. Now we're going to talk about these strategies. There's five of them. Okay. The first strategy I would suggest is to know your weaknesses. You probably already know them, um, because you've, you've run your, your, uh, project through a number of different gauntlets, your professors, your outside reviewers, your industry partners, your friends, your family, all these people. So, You've looked at the project, your other team members have looked at the project, have other teams maybe look at the project, have professors look at it, whoever you can get to look at the project and point out the weaknesses, because now's your opportunity to shore up any weaknesses that you have. Um, 
you know, these are images from the report that we submitted early on. Uh, and there were some things in there that we knew that we needed to address. And so we shored them up by the time we got to the end. So that when you, this is, this is a picture of me and my team and another team that competed and our professor, Tom Collins, uh, as we were walking up to NREL, by the time you get to this point, by the time you're walking up to NREL, you know, it's game time. Um, I, we didn't know they were taking our picture. Um, <laughs> by the way, they will be taking your picture probably. Um, number two, I would say is make very diligent progress, i.e. be doing something every single day. Um, there are any number of things you can be doing day to day, lots of dress rehearsals. Um, and again, you should be seeking critique and not praise. And so if you don't know what to do, you should ask a, a colleague, a classmate, a professor, what's something I can work on right now? Um, here's a great little, you know, this, this idea again about not seeking praise, but criticism from a book uh, called It's Not How Good You Are, It's How Good You Want to Be, one of my favorite books. It's awesome. Check it out. Um, number three, as a strategy, you really want to lead the dance. Um, you don't want to follow. By the time when you get to the Q&A part with the jurors, you want to make sure it doesn't spin out of control and become obvious that you don't know that you've lost control. <laughs> you know, and so I think the way that you the way that you lead the dance is by having a really strong storyline to keep things focused. Because if you're not focusing the jury on what you want them to think about, they're going to think about what they want to think about. And that's so that's that's part of like that storyline will direct the attention of your audience. Um, you want to gracefully respond to anything that's said to you um, in critique, and this is true of any critique, right? You want to gracefully respond and be open. You're not being defensive, but you also need to keep leading. And so as you're answering the questions that are thrown at you or the criticism that's coming your way, you got to roll with it, but you want to bring them back to what the big idea is. I can't tell you how to do that, but uh, because it depends on what, what, what you've been given to work with, uh, but it's really important to try to always bring it back to what your storyline is. What's your story? Um, here's a master of that, Ted Benson, uh, who had, he presented the year that I was out there as one of, and was one of the grand jurors. And he gave an amazing presentation with just one of the best storylines that had the whole, I, I think a number of tears were shed, plenty of laughs, all that stuff. Ted Benson, he's great. I don't know if he's there this year. If he is, you're in for a treat. If not, you should look him up. Um, number four. I think it's really important as a strategy to try to create an emotional connection with the jury or with the audience in general. I believe that this is really why, you know, I, we won the year that I went, my partner and I, Luke um, Camp, won our, our category, the single family suburban, but we did not win the grand jury prize. I, there's a number of reasons for that. Number one, I believe that the pro project that these folks on your screen presented was a better project, but also even if the projects were equally good, um, Ryerson University and University of Trent, Toronto created a much more emotionally compelling story than Luke and I did. Luke and I had a story about a really great house. Ryerson University and University of Toronto had a story about how their scheme could transform urban landscapes and take what's essentially marginalized land and turn it into high performance building while at the same time increasing equity. I mean, it was amazing. That's why they won, I think. So um, some other just little tips, you know, uh, because at this point you've got your story, right? So maybe you can beef up your story, but maybe not. No matter what your story is, things that will help you create an emotional connection are to number one, be yourself, you know, just get up there. And again, if you're coming from a perspective of having fun, that will be more easy to do than if you're feeling like super scared, right? Um, <laughs> if you are feeling scared or nervous, breathe and relax like ahead of time. And even when you're practicing, Practice breathing before you start speaking um, as just a way to, to train your body, you know, a little bit of muscle memory and really focus on people. And I mean that in the sense that as you're telling your story, focus on the human components of the story, the community where your building is going to be, the occupants of your building, the industry partners you're working with, um, you know, any of that is is what creates an emotional connection. A low EUI number or a low HER score does not create an emotional connection, right? Everybody that's at the contest is gonna have a good HER score. So you're not gonna win it with your HER score. Um, you're gonna win it by making a great case and creating an emotionally compelling reason why your project stands out. 
And then also try your best, this is not easy to do, disconnect your emotions from the critique that you will receive from the jury. That will help you have more fun and that will help you also be graceful. For instance, when Luke and I got up to talk about our project, we had reminded ourselves again and again and been practicing. We were not our project. You are not your project. When someone critiques your project, they're not critiquing you. This works best if when the project is being critiqued, if it if you're engaged in that, like we were standing there critiquing the project with the jury, you know, <laughs> like but it doesn't have to be perfect. Nobody expects it to be perfect. So that was one way that we turned it into a dance was we, we like danced with them. Um, research your jury a little bit because all these juries are going to be a little different. The jurors all have their own background. Uh, they're going to come from different environments. And so if you know, for instance, that you have a jury member that is a code expert um, or a jury member that is a home builder, most of you will likely have a jury member, I think, that's a home builder. I don't know for sure, but my guess is. So you can expect certain kinds of questions from those type of people. I would, going back to the thing before about shoring up your weaknesses, if you have a known weakness in an area where you have an expert judge, I would go find another expert that can maybe help you, you know, craft your, um, your statement about that thing that you know to be weak. Okay, those are some big ideas. Oh, hey, there's Steve. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, and there I am in the back, so you can tell that I'm not presenting here, but this is from that big group of uh, slides from the year that I presented. The, the point of this is to say, look at this jury right here. You know, I'm not presenting to them right now. I'm part of the audience, but you can tell that at least three out of the five members of the jury have smiles on their faces and they're engaged. Two of them are, it's, it's harder to read, but still, I would say that we even have like three and a half smiles and, and maybe just a little bit of interest. Contrast that. What do we what do we have here? You know, we've got the raised eyebrow. Uh, Steve's kind of like, no, nah, he's sitting back in his chair. He's not sure there. You can tell that they are skeptical. <laughs> this maybe this is because people have gotten defensive. Maybe it's because they didn't know what they were talking about. But the goal is that you want to keep things, if you can, on the fun side. Um, if you're seeing things like this, um, yeah, like take a deep breath. <laughs> okay, there's our strategies. And now let's talk about some actual like boots on the ground tactics, uh, which are some of them implementations of those strategies. Um, but again, this is this is like a, a toolbox that I think any one of these tools on their own could be helpful. They, they don't have to be paired together. Um, I think the number one tactic is that every moment that you are there, you should enjoy the experience. This is a, an amazing thing that you're about to do. I had such a good time when I was out there. I made some new friends, people that have become friends to this day. I made some fantastic industry connections. I mean, that's what these things are about. So um, if this is your first event like this, like you were in for a treat, it might be, yeah, it, it, you, you will, will open your eyes to this whole world. Um, these are some slides, you know, from the some pictures from the year that I was there. Like, it is so much fun. Um, you're going to have a great time. And if you're enjoying yourself throughout, that will help you when you're presenting to also enjoy yourself. Um, okay. I think the next one is to really be ready for the question and answer period. And I'm, I mean, like, you, you have no idea what kind of questions they're going to ask you. Um, that It would be too much to, I'm not asking you to divine the future, but I'm asking you to be ready for the fact that you are going to be asked questions. So there's two strategies, I think, here. One, and I've seen both in practice. I'm sure Steve has seen both in practice. I'd love to hear Steve's perspective on this, actually. I would say strategy A is have a point person. That point person sort of is was either already serving as the project manager or they're at least kind of serving as that role during the presentation. Or the point person could, that, that project manager idea is that there's one person that is the point person for the whole project. And if you've got a huge team, that might be a good, good way to organize. If you have a smaller team or if you have very defined and limited scopes that each person worked on, maybe it's better to take a subject matter expert approach where when a particular question is asked, you know that the person that handled that area is going to be the one to start answering it. Uh, the goal here is that you do not want a question asked by the jury and then everybody looks around at each other on the team with that sort of like, uh, who's going to talk here? 
You know, that's a, that's a bad moment. That makes it look like you're unprepared. So whatever your strategy, which strategy you use is less important than when the question is asked that you, you just, you hit the ball, it's thrown and you hit it, hit it right back. Um, I think that these two approaches of either having a project manager or a subject matter expert are good approaches for large groups because the larger the group, the more difficult it is to know necessarily who who's going to jump in and answer. And you also don't want everybody starting to talk at once. That would also appear disorganized. Um, another strategy um, is just to negate everything I just said and don't have a point person. But I would also add that this is not good for large groups. This worked really, really well for Luke and I. Um, it was kind of a free for all approach, but Luke and I presented just as two people. We had some other team members uh, that played supporting roles, but they did not come to the competition with us. So since it was just the two of us, and if you have a small team, that approach can work really well. It's organic, it's natural. It really helped Luke and I, I think, create a feeling of dancing with the jury. Uh, but it's not right for every situation. Um, I think that this is much better for small groups, like I said. Uh, number two, this is like a bunch of gibberish and it kind of includes, I actually, as I was looking at this again, I left it in here because maybe it's helpful to see this. Um, but like, you know, these are just, these are actually preference things for the most part. Um, so I'm going to skip past this, but I think the most important two of them are number four and five. And that is don't be obtuse, you know, um, and I should have actually said that's, that's one of those things where what the better way to say that would be, don't be unnecessarily difficult to understand or hard to understand. Um, you know, communicate in, even though it's a, it's a, it's a, you can use jargon there. People are subject matter experts. There's no reason to make things. Um, needlessly complicated. And then number five is obviously just be consistent with everything that you do. Everything that you do. That's between your poster and your presentation and your report and all that stuff. That does tie right into number three, which is when it comes to your presentation, if you don't already have a template, but I'm guessing that you do, you should make one. Um, the template is the first order of business. Um, and if you're already done without one, then you're already done without one. But next time around, make yourself a template because you will thank yourself for that. Um, the template should be coordinated with the report and the poster. And the reason having the template is good because then if you decide to make a change, you don't have to literally change every slide. You're changing one thing and that's, that's you know, trickling through your whole presentation. Um, and that template then becomes an organizational tool as well for your team and for the audience and the jury. So this was the template that Luke and I used, and I saw many other very similar templates. It wouldn't have to be done this way. This is just one way to do it. We had a heading at the top. It told our team name, and it told what category or section we were talking about. And then along the bottom, we had a little bit of a timeline, and that timeline allowed us to, for the audience to know where we were at in the presentation. Um, it also helped us to know where we were at in the presentation and to watch our own time so that we didn't um, run out of time that's true in the short or in the long presentation but we sort of bombed the long i bombed the long present or short presentation which i'll tell you about briefly um so you can see there's also some builds in our slides uh but then this was our poster so you can see the connection there the poster and the slideshow look the same they use the same graphic language the same colors the same fonts all that this was our report it's all tied together i mean you really are branding your project so that every interaction that the jury has with it is building the same kind of thing. When they come up and look at your poster and, and that casual interaction happens, that again is a touch with your project that is an opportunity. And if everything is coordinated, it helps them um, remember better projects from each other if your project has a distinct and recognizable identity. Because they, you can imagine, they have a number of projects. I think, what, 10, 8, 12? I don't know. They're looking at a lot of projects for each jury. Um, okay, number four, how you organize your presentation um, can again be done any number of ways. I would just suggest, this goes along with that idea of consistency, that you use the challenge categories or if in your project report you did not use the challenge categories, then you mirror what your project report is. You wouldn't have to have to do it this way um, but it is probably the easiest uh, way. Um, I don't want to say it's foolproof, but it, it's close. You know, it's hard to go wrong with sticking with the same organizational structure because it, again, imagine this, the jury has 
uh, either literal or figurative score sheets, probably literal score sheets with these categories. I don't know if the categories are the same, but they're probably close. So if they have a question in a particular category and they need more information from your project about that, and yet you've used an entirely different method to structure your whole presentation, they it, it's going to be more difficult for them to get the answer to the question. Whereas I, I actually literally had a juror, it was not Steve, but I had um, one of the jurors come up to me after the event uh, in the hallway and say, the fact that you organized your everything you did according to the categories was one of the reasons that it was so easy to see yours standing out as the best because apparently a lot of people didn't do that and so because then the jury's left like trying to dig through and find answers to stuff obviously it's too late when it comes to the report but this is your opportunity to maybe clarify um okay another tactic i like this one a lot um because of the time lag that we have in the way that we're presenting it might not come off as well today as it comes off live because there's a lag and i don't know if that lag is a half a second or two and a half seconds and so it's really hard for me to know when to push the button but what you can see on the screen now probably is that on the left hand side we had the plan that came from our industry partner lauren wood builders and on the right hand side we had our transformation of that plan and i'm not going to talk through exactly what we did but you'll start to see these builds bouncing back and forth from the left to the right where areas are highlighted in one plan in one color and then highlighted the same area in the other plan in a different color and then the arrows are being used um, to show movement or to show some there's lines that are going to come up at some point for some plumbing um, things basically this was a very easy way without the slide um, advancing on the screen to really make these floor plans come alive in a way you know here i'm talking about the work triangle in the kitchen and how we were able to create further advantages for that work triangle so even getting into program elements you know talking about how we're transforming the space any way that you can make your, your slideshow, um, the graphics of your slideshow reinforce the words that are coming out of your mouth as they're happening and create that dynamism, that's really gonna help you out. And then I think the last move here was we showed, hey, the longest plumbing run was you know so long and here we transformed it and we, we shaved 12 feet off of it or something. Um, okay, the next tactic, is to show some process, uh, not necessarily like sketches from not you know not your first napkin sketch. Although maybe that's what uh, that could be one way to do it. I'm talking here about like maybe your design process. What we decided to do was to show our design process. You're going to see a series of steps. We illustrated the design moves that we made and the corresponding um, shift to the hers analysis as a result of those design moves. So this was a really easy way for us to both use this metric that was being used throughout the whole competition and that we're all familiar with, and then to show how we uh, pushed that number down using our design process. Um, and again, uh, we aimed for consistency. We keyed the colors of the line to the actual colors with the eyedropper over on the left-hand side on the bar. All those little things, you know, they make a difference. Okay. Number seven, uh, I think I've hinted at this before and now we will explicitly say it. Use your presentation in your poster to fill the known holes in your report. You know, we've, we've talked about shoring up your weaknesses as a strategy. The tactic is this, that we, uh, Luke and I looked through a report, we found the things that we knew we wanted to focus on. In some cases, it was some moisture analysis and some other things, and we made certain that those got layered into our poster and then into our slideshow. Or if you felt really good about uh, everything, you don't think there's any holes, you can take it to the next level. Um, actually, that thing about moisture and dew point that I said for us was really a matter of taking it to the next level because we had, we had already addressed it as per the project requirements, but then we wanted to show that even after we submitted the report and uh, everything else, we continued to work on the project to keep making these choices. And we did a woofy analysis and some other things. Um, and we showed that. So that was like a bonus. That was like the, the jurors had never seen that in anything else. And, and so we tried to not wow them, but just like just to impress them. Like for us, this is a living thing. This is an ongoing conversation. The project is not dead. We didn't do it just to check a box. You know, we were engaged. Um, OK, a few more here on the tactics. Um, the short presentation is all about the narrative. This is, if anything, 
I, I was I made a lot of mistakes here. Uh, learn from my mistakes. Here's Luke and I presenting uh, to the grand jury. And um, okay, here is the behind the scenes of our long presentation. It was 55 slides. And that was, uh, you know, what, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, something like that. I don't know. Our short presentation was 40 flipping slides. Like, <laughs> this is this is truly a WTF moment. I don't know what we were thinking there. Um, the The short presentation should have been like, 10 slides um, or 20 slides maybe, but not 40 because it li the literally the presentation ended with me realizing that I had five minutes of content to get through in two minutes. And so I had to say to the audience, okay, fasten your seatbelts and then like try to be that micro machine dude from the commercials from way back when I was young. Um, that's, that's not good. <laughs> I don't think that's, again, I think that Ryerson in Toronto literally had a better project than us, but even if our projects had equal merit, I think they still would have won because their presentation focused on the narrative. I would say, you know, what's the big picture of your project? That's the most important thing. You don't need to dig into, like we tried to show that, that uh, descending graph with the HERS analysis during our short presentation. Skip all of that. I, I mean, that's my suggestion. Skip all of of the, we've got a great HERS score. We know that already. Everybody's got a great HERS score. Just tell us the big picture. Focus on the outcomes of the project. If this thing happens, why is it gonna be amazing? How is it gonna change the world? Why is it deserved to stand out above the other projects? Because the numbers alone are not gonna cut it. Again, everybody's got good numbers. You need to make people's hearts sing. If you can do that, and that's what Ryerson in Toronto did the year that I was there, you got it. Um, here they are. You know, they did it. They had such a good presentation. I even as they were showing their wall section, I have to say I had a lot of critique about their wall section, um, which I talked to them at the bar afterwards. But um, but I totally was on board with their story. Like they nailed it. It was amazing. Here's something that I just violated about an hour before I'm giving you this presentation. I just gave an MR thesis presentation. I realized as I was concluding it. I hadn't really decided exactly where I was gonna end. Oh, that's the worst. If you're gonna memorize anything, memorize the conclusion, know where you're gonna end because the absolute worst way to end a presentation is like this going, um, okay, that's it, which I'm sure you've heard that and maybe even said it, I know I have. Or, you know, less bad than that, but also not ideal is any, questions at least you're at least you're not trailing off you know you're not ending with an ellipsis mark you're you're actually throwing the ball into the court of the jury that is a fine way to do it i it's not the most elegant or uh powerful but it works and of course the, the line any questions might come after another conclusion line here was our conclusion we are delighted that the forest refuge home will break ground this fall and then i think we said thank you and and that was it because we wanted, we, again, this is about controlling the storyline and the narrative. You want to make sure that the, where the, um, where everything falls and the last thing that is said is powerful, you know? And then, oh, and then again, we took that, these are not the droids you're looking for uh, thing. Instead of softly saying any questions, you know, like with a questioning tone of voice, we, we issued it as a command. Now we'd like to hear from you, you know? Like, again, lead the dance lead the dance and, and try to do it gracefully. And this was the slide that we used to end. We wanted to focus people's attention on the fact that this thing was going to get built. That was our big idea. And so we did everything we could to conclude with reinforcing that big idea. Um, okay, have somebody else, uh, another tactic here, and we're almost to the end of the tactics, have somebody else proofread your presentation. Not just, not just other people in your group, because I guarantee you, you're probably not going to catch everything. Just like this presentation that you're watching now, I have a, a bunch of thanks. Thank you, Lynn, <laughs> for Lynn caught a couple of things when I sent her my slides. She noticed some word order issues and, that I hadn't noticed because I'm too close to the presentation and that I had misspelled something. And notice it even has a, a dang red line underneath it. Like it's PowerPoint is trying to tell me that it was misspelled and I couldn't even catch that. So thank you, Lynn. And you should find somebody else to read your, your presentation. There's nothing worse than um, misspellings on slides. Okay, in summary, we talked about this big idea. We talked about 
um, controlling your own metaphor, and then also how that translates into your narrative and your concepts driving everything about your project. Um, we then talked about some big picture strategies about ways that you can approach uh, this and um, things that you might want to consider. And then we looked at some actual um, on the ground tactics that you can use to make your presentation better. So I hope that these uh, that these were helpful in some way or another. And I would just like to conclude by saying again that your metaphor controls everything. And if there's anything you take away from this presentation uh, and that I can share is that this isn't even just true just for this presentation. It's literally true for life. And um, yeah, I, I hope you have fun and enjoy playing with that idea. Uh, and with that, I am going to um, now pass the ball back to whoever's coming next. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recall. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, Chris. What an inspiring presentation. We appreciate your time and all of, the, all of that great information uh, is fantastic for the students as they present. So with that, I'd like to introduce Steve Brown. He has been one of our jurors several times. And as a third generation lumberman and builder with more than 40 years of experience, Steve has been around the construction business most of his life. He started building in the Dallas area in 1982. And in 1984, he changed the course of his construction business to build only extreme energy efficient homes using structural insulated panels as the primary building enclosure. He also helped pioneer many of the green techniques used today and has won many national housing awards over the years. Most recently, DOE Housing Innovation Awards. In addition to being re nationally recognized as an authority on green buildings, extreme energy efficient homes, he also serves on the board of directors of the Green Extreme Homes Community Development Corporation and Plano Housing Corporation. So uh, Steve is a very experienced juror and has worked on this program for several years. And I'll turn it over to you, to Steve. Over to you, Steve. Great. Thanks, Rachel. And Chris, that was a great presentation. For all of you out there, in listening to Chris, you can tell why he won. He makes a great presentation. He, he talks. He doesn't try to tell you, but he talks to you, and that's important. So I decided that rather than have slides, uh, a lot of slides, I just have uh, one slide. So Rachel, if you'll roll it and go to the next one. And here it is, and I'm gonna give you 15 minutes of pure gold, and here they are in 10 bullet parts. This is what the judges are looking for. This, this is what makes or breaks you as a team. And let me say something also about Chris and Luke when they made their presentation. We typically see four or five or six people in a presentation. That's pretty normal. When two guys walk up in front of you, the first thought in your head is, as the judge is, mm, this isn't gonna be good. It was fantastic because they rolled off of each other. They didn't interrupt, but they had a great rapport between the two of them, and they talked to us as a judge. So first and foremost, relax. This in the Senate hearing, the judges can tell if you're nervous, and that's not good. You don't want us to know that. So just take your time, have fun. That's what this thing is all about. Uh, uh, Chris also made a point about having a point person. That's a real good idea. So, so think about those things and do that. Second of all, the judges, and I can tell you as a judge, I was just as excited as the students were to be there. It is a great honor. It is a privilege to come there. We work our, our lives in this industry, in the building industry, commercial or residential and we strive to be the best at what we can do. To be selected to be a judge is a great honor and to come up there and to, to work with students that we know in the future, this is what our building industry is. You are our future and we'll talk about that later on. So know that we're just as excited to be there as you are and, and we all will relax and, and have a good time. So now let's get into what you need to know. Tell your story, don't read your story tell your story. Notes are for reference only. 
You need to work at this thing enough that your your fluid in what you speak and and in in the the uh, bullet points that you want to make and the points you want everybody uh, to uh, to understand. Know your subject, and that's that's the thing, and be excited to talk about it. As a judge, I always look for the excitement in the person. If they were truly interested in what they were doing and truly excited, you can tell it it shows. So so do that. Be sure to, uh, to know about your subject and, and, and be ready at the end to answer questions about it, but know very well about your subject. Be able to explain what you wanted to accomplish and tell how you did it. Now, when you started this program, you had an idea of a house, a townhouse, a multifamily or a commercial building. You knew what you wanted to do. You knew how you wanted to get there. Tell us about that. Those are the things uh, as a judge that we want to hear. Uh, Use acronyms. That's fine. I can't tell you the number of acronyms that were thrown at me in all the different presentations. Some I knew, some I didn't. Remember this about your judges. I was a builder. So as a builder, I've got just enough knowledge about all the different trades and all the different aspects of what I do to make me dangerous. That's just how much I know. So I depend upon industry uh, uh, icons. I look for an HVAC contractor that's a whole lot more knowledgeable than I am. I look for a mechan uh, uh, a, a, a electrician that knows things that I don't know. I'm looking for those people. Now, he knows or she knows things in their industry that I don't know. So when you use an acronym, for instance, when I was growing up, a CD, the only CDs we knew were certificates of deposits at the bank. Then the next thing you know, they're called construction drawings. Then they're compact disc. So when you use an acronym, tell us what it is. Tell us what it stands for at least once. And then give the acronym for it after you've told us what it stands for. And then you can use the acronym all the time. Okay, That helps the judges out because a lot of times things are thrown at us. We don't understand it. And if we don't understand it, we're not going to give you as many points uh, um, in your in your uh, speech practice 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 and after you finish practicing practice some more work in front of each other this is something else Chris brought up and this was something that we really noticed about his presentation they had it down they knew exactly what they were talking about and you need to do the same thing Talk to each other, stand up in front of each other and do your parts. Do it in front of a mirror, do it in front of people you don't know. It needs to be a conversation. It needs to be something as a judge that I can sit there. When you start talking to me, I immediately pick up on it and I understand what you're trying to tell me. Now, back on the first part where we talked about being nervous because that's something that w will affect you, I find that one of the best ways to calm yourself is before your presentation and just right before maybe two or three minutes before whatever talk to the judges just strike up a conversation ask them where they're from ask them what business they're in and that conversation eases the the, the nervousness between you and the judge so try that that always works here's one that we really really like tell us about your mistakes the ones that you made what went wrong and how you fixed them we all make mistakes. I make them every day. I have not built a single house, building, apartment complex that, that went right all the way through. I always had problems. That's the whole point of this industry. You've got to be able to solve problems on the fly. So tell us the problems that you had with, with the uh, presentation. Tell us uh, when you drew the house, what, what went wrong with it. One of the greatest experiences I had uh, in, in, in the industry. If you don't know who Joe Stebrick is, after this webinar, go look him up. He is a guru in building enclosures. And his company, Building Science Corporation, is one of the leaders, international leaders in the industry. One thing I really respect about Joe, and I respect a lot of things about him, but at one of his seminars in front of everybody, he gave a complete lecture on how he screwed up how he made a mistake in a building and what he had to do to go back and fix it. But he admitted the problem. He admitted the mistake and, and the reasoning why he did it the way he did it and what he had to do to go back and change it and what he learned from it. And that's the thing. Learn from your mistakes. 
So please, if something went terribly wrong, <laughs> tell us about it. We want to hear. We want to know about these things. The other thing is, if you're here, if you're at this presentation, you're already a winner. So don't worry about winning. What you want to get across to the juror is, here is what I want to build. Here is how I want to build it. Here's how it's going to perform. And I want you to believe in it as much as I believe in it. So if you're there already, you're already a winner. Don't worry about winning. It will come naturally. That was another thing about Chris's presentation. They, it, it, to me, it was never about winning. I was so impressed with their presentation and how they made it to us and how comfortable I felt in asking questions and how they answered questions. It was a rapport between two different people about the same industry and, and getting the right answers uh, for the questions that I had. He made me feel very comfortable. Um, and so with that, he got high scores and, and they won. Okay. So here's the last point that I want to tell you, and this is what the jurors understand. Our industry is, we, we need young people. We need them desperately in our industry. And we're looking to you as the future of our industry. Your ideas, your thoughts, what you put on paper, what you build. You are the future of our building industry. And as a judge, we know that. So we're there to help you. If you have questions before or after, talk to us. Uh, we're not going to, to give you any extra points for those things, but come talk to us. We'd like to know. And believe me, the jurors are just as interested in your projects as you've been. And with that, Rachel, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Steve. That was really great. And Steve is correct on everything he's uh, listed here. So thank you. All right. Now I get the less exciting part but still very important um i'll give you a little bit of perspective of what's coming up and a few reminders and then we'll answer some questions okay so uh at this time you have completed your project report all that's left are project presentations and posters